Good morning. My name is Karen Wills. I'm the head of marketing here at Strategicon, this disembodied voice that you're that you're hearing. Um, I will be running the technology and, and hosting for you. Um, I thought before we actually get going on our straight talk, there's some uh, housekeeping things that we need to we need to take care of. Um, first of all, you know, thank you for coming. We really appreciate everybody's attendance. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box on your panel. Uh, and we will be responding to them, and I'll get them to the panelists during the course of the of the event. Uh, and then just a couple other minor things. If you happen to be in the Boston area this uh, next week, please come and visit us. We were attending the R and D Sourcing and Procurement Conference, which promises to be, you know, pretty insightful and and lots of good information and and uh, and conversations going on there. And then following that in early June, we'll, we will actually, um, our, uh, our host or our moderator here, Anka Kopescu, who's our CEO, will actually be at the PCMG conference, as will, as will Rob, is my understanding. So, um, so with that, let me introduce Anka, whom I already mentioned is our CEO and, and certainly the driving force behind our revolutionary clinical maestro platform. Um, She's very passionate, to say the least, about uh, you know driving efficiency and innovation, um, which led her to building a solution when she could not find any any others. Um, and as such, we continue to build uh, Clinical Maestro. It's a technology for you know clinical study planning, outsourcing, and financial management. Um, and to date, we haven't really found anyone that can uh, compete with our technology. So, you know, great, great job on your, your vision and your insight, Anka, and I'll now turn it over to you to introduce Rob. Um, thank you so much, Karen. It's a pleasure to have you all today. And um, we have a special guest on a special topic. Uh, the topic is navigating change, uh, especially as it comes to um, a clinical outsourcing and, and strategy. Um, and my guest today is a like-minded professional, um, Rob Aitchinson from 4C Life Sciences. Uh, Rob, welcome. Um, super thrilled to have you here today. I know we discussed about this topic and we, as I said, we think very much alike. Um, so I'd like to start by um, asking you to tell the audience a little bit about your background, about who you are. and maybe what brought you to this, uh, to the webinar. Certainly, thank you, Anka. Um, yeah, so uh, by way of introduction, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Rob H. I'm the head of R&D Outsourcing Advisory uh, at 4C Life Sciences. Um, bit of a, a mouthful as a term, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. You know, I come from a background of, uh, of clinical outsourcing. Um, in the industry as opposed to in consultancy. So 4C Life Sciences is part of 4C Associates, which is a consultancy company that um, has specialized in procurement, supply chain, and um, sourcing, as well as strategy and operations and cost transformation. Um, obviously, my passion, as you know, and, and others hopefully as well, lies in, in cl clinical outsourcing and providing uh, the right kind of solutions to companies of all sizes so that they can get the most out of the, the funds and the monies that they have to, uh, to 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 deliver as many um, new products to the market as possible. Uh, my background is you know, many years, about 11, 12 years, I think, with Pfizer in a variety of both clinical outsourcing uh, roles, but also in CMC. I've worked for the likes of Novartis and other big major companies. I've worked for smaller biotech companies. Um, and I was head of outsourcing and contracts for a mid-sized Japanese pharmaceutical company as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully I've got, you know, a tough pedigree to talk on the subject. Um, I know that one of our biggest problems is, is shutting us up, so I will try to be as succinct as possible on this subject. But uh, again, yeah, I think the the opportunities to use the right expertise, the right technology, you know, the right um, solutions for companies of all sizes is what kind of brought me here to have this conversation about you know facilitating change and to get to the right solutions. So okay. thank you for very much for having me. Well, thank you so much, Rob. Before we get started, I would actually like to take the temperature of the audience today. And we saw there were quite a few registrants. So, Karen, if you can help us out, we'd like to run a very quick poll. Um, and uh, again, the intent is to, before we launch into a whole discussion about change, we'd like to see how you think about it. So, um, 
the first question here is how difficult is it to uh, get buy-in and implement changes in your approach, strategy, or processes for clinical um, outsourcing? Uh, and you can pick one. And please don't be shy. And Karen, I think you are seeing on, 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 on the background what's going on. So I'll ask you to help me run the poll. Not, not a problem, Anka. Yep, we have, uh, we have about half the people have voted now. I'm just encouraging the other half to, uh, to get in your vote. Um, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't divulge the results. I think you and Rob are going to be a little, uh, a little surprised, but the, uh, but we'll, um, but maybe not, maybe not. So, um, I'll give it another, another few seconds. Um, you know, please just put in your vote. It's not hard. Is it, you know, how difficult is it? Is it super hard? Is it just challenging? Is it pretty straightforward? Is it really easy? So. Is it easy uh, after this webinar, Karen? Yes, well, fair enough, fair enough, Anka. <laughs> so, all right, so we're gonna just, you know, a couple more seconds and now I will, I'm gonna close the poll now and, uh, and we will, I'm gonna share, I'll share the results. So can you see okay. the results now? Yes. Yep. Uh, I actually need to put my glasses to make sure I see them right. <laughs> okay, 83% are saying it's challenging and 17% pretty straightforward. Rob, what do you think? I mean, right? I, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's fantastic if you've got an organization that is very open to uh, to, to making making these changes um, and, and looking at that, so that's great because one of the things that we want is to for people to be educated about the, the value and, and benefits associated with, you know, a, a, a structured strategy um, and, you know, and then implementing it. So I think for those of you for whom it is straightforward, that's that's fantastic news. I suppose I'm not particularly surprised that for 83 percent it's a challenging environment. Um, you know there is misconceptions about um, about outsourcing. Um, you know oftentimes people will talk about say what's your sourcing strategy. Of course the real question should be what's your resourcing strategy because outsourcing alone is just a uh, a solution to a resourcing problem and I think this is sometimes missed um, particularly when um, it's part of a you know people's day job so you know I, I don't suppose I am all that surprised that it's that it's uh, it's challenging that's my take on it anyway Adam what about you I am not surprised uh, I've seen very few companies in um, in which change is straightforward and that usually comes all the way from the top when there is a mandate for change uh, and it's uh, it has a lot of the uh, upper management leadership support. Then the change is straightforward, um, and it, it's it's actually pretty well structured. Most of the time, it's a conflict between uh, either um, uh, the function wanting to implement change and having to get the buy-in of the management, or the management de deciding somewhat independently that change is needed. And, and trying to push it down the organization. So um, most of the time is really challenging. Um, I believe we have another poll question. Am I right, Karen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's see it. Okay, so which areas of facilitating change do you think present, um, do you think present the most challenge present <laughs> sorry do you think present the most challenges with your organization and here you can pick two and they come between building the business case to demonstrate the return on investment remapping and thinking about operational transformation training uh, stakeholder or internal customer management and ongoing adoption um to new ways of working uh, this is this is going well everybody's very interested in uh in telling you what what their what where their difficulties are so this is it looks like almost, almost everybody's in so give it a i'm going to give it just another second and then we'll uh we'll show you the results okay So if any, any last minute voters going once, 
going twice, feel free to pick two. All right, we're gonna close it out and I'm gonna share with you res the results. Okay. Rob, your thoughts first. Well, I mean, again, am I I'm massively surprised? Um, no, I suppose or not. I mean, it's interesting that no one finds the training aspect difficult. Um, that's that, that I suppose is a bit of a surprise. You know, sometimes, you know, I suppose maybe it goes hand in hand with you know adherence to the new ways of working. Um, you know, it's a, maybe it's means slightly differently. Um, you know, again, it, it's it's fairly consistent with some of the things that I've seen. I mean, when I was at at, at, at Pfizer, you know, and, and doing things in the the analytical research and development space it was amazing when you try to do some new new things and then all of a sudden everybody became an exception to the rule um so as a result you know everybody was taken out of you know you you, you make some predictions about what the rni roa is going to be um and then of course it doesn't come to pass because you know the volume of work that you put through the new new ways of working doesn't come come out so you know again it all of these things are are intermingled you know getting the buy-in from stakeholders will be from realistic roi um i think it's it's interesting as well the process remapping and operational transformation i think we've seen that a lot is that people want to make changes um or they can see the, the value in doing it but they either can't you know physically fit it into their day job with all other things going on and i, I think we'll you will touch on some of that again later on um but you know, to actually say this is what we need to do, and this is how we're going to to incorporate it into what can be very complicated um, and you know network of, of of processes and people and teams to make it actually work. So I don't think that's a a massive surprise. ROI is always difficult, particularly as we look at new ways of working. I think some of the things you know, if I look back over my career, you know, realistically. It was pretty straightforward when I started in terms of the services required to, to develop an, uh, a drug and, um, and deliver a clinical trial. But now with, with so many new technologies, with new ways of working, with the you know, DCT, with patient services, with you know, all these other different ways of, of doing things, trying to actually work out what the, the decent ROI is going to be on some of these things is, um, is difficult. You know, and it is difficult and people are cynical and they want to test it. So, uh, you yeah, that, know, that is a big area as well. So, uh, yeah interesting results what about your your take on them yeah pretty much the same as i'm thinking about building the business case um we see it quite a lot in the technology implementation and uh demonstrating the roi has to uh, allow for sufficient time um and uh it it has to be measurable um mm -hmm. and <clears throat> i find it challenging many times for people to um, establish what the baseline is and a baseline 99% of the time is working in Excel in, in a highly inefficient manner and 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 calling the baseline metrics it's it requires some self-reflection um, <laughs> which sometimes could be challenging <laughs> and of course you have to go to the process remapping the operational transformation the training the <laughs> customer engagement and all the other uh, and the adoption of the technology, all the other elements in order to, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> demonstrate the ROI at, at the end of the journey. Um, so I find this um, uh, challenging and it goes hand in hand with with all of the elements below. And of course, it's it's very important, particularly in the stakeholder internal customer engagement to um, actually have a structure and very clearly defined objectives, um, which actually leads into my next question to you. Um, so Rob, you, you've seen change in small organizations, you've seen change in gigantic organization. Um, based on your experience as a consultant, but also as first-hand outsourcing person, mm -hmm. um, what do you think are the top three, let's say, must-haves in order to succeed in, in driving change forward? So, I mean, like, it's, like, it's great, great question. And it's one, you know, we've talked about at length before. Um, I think the danger that people mistake, the first thing people do is they don't understand their organization first. And I kind of touched on it a little bit with regards to the the, the outsourcing strategy, you know, and, and the resourcing strategy. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is, 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 you know, how am I going to get this done? And so people don't necessarily understand or think about or do that self-reflection and understand what their um 
their their organization wants. You know, what are you actually trying to achieve? And I, I read a paper some time ago, um, and I, I went back and had a quick look at it because it quoted something quite nicely, which is basically you need to have a, a clear set of strategic intent and a realistic set of management expectations. Um, to drive what your sourcing efforts and your change in, in, in strategy is going to be because sort of a, a random or unguided activities will almost always produce poor results. Um, you know, so understanding and it, so it kind of goes back to what we, we looked about stakeholder management, achieving change, you know, demonstrating that the building the business case um, you know, is set to what does the company actually want to achieve and how is this contributing to achieving that goal? So. That's one aspect to it. Then it's moving on to the second part of it, which is around the the nature of of your own internal organisation. You know, the 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 use of the external market, the change, the use of technology, the use of, of additional skills and services has got to complement your internal operating model. Um, and if it's going to go in a slightly different direction, it's going to have to. You are going to have to change what you do internally. And of course, that may bring in different um, stakeholders, different um, affected groups, you know, so you need to be aware of the things and it's all leading to ultimately um, the third part, which is basically putting together a proper consolidated change management plan. Because I think people go into this and sort of like a bit haphazardly um, is what I've seen. Um, it's not particularly well structured at all times. You know, you're trying to do things on the fly, on the hoof as quickly as you possibly can. And these, so these need to combine and pull together all the different strands that you need to be, be looking at, you know, the, well, the aims and goals, the stakeholders, the affected party, but also the impacted groups, uh, but also from those stakeholders, the impacted group, who's going to be a positive force behind this change and who is going to be potentially resistant and put, put, put robot in the way or, or be that, um, that critical friend to actually challenge you on what you're actually doing and what you're trying to achieve. You know, and this with the, the timelines will become the roadmap. And that is what you work to. It's a bit like a contract on a on a, a clinical trial. This should be your, you know, this should be falling apart at the end of it. This should be your ultimate project management tool to get things done. Um, so, and there is fourth, actually, I know you only asked for three, um, but I can't help myself, um, is learn from other people's mistakes, if you can. You know, reach out and find out. I, um, because some of the changes that you try to make and may seem the right way to go can have unforeseen consequences. I was talking to a a, a, a former colleague of mine at a, a large major pharmaceutical company, and I'm going to remain nameless on them because for obvious reasons I'm about to explain, they, they put in place a very large, you know, and a major change to their, their process now and the ways of doing things. What they, they had their own metric associated with uh, ratios of investigative fees to direct fees of uh, outsourcing arrangements and the the goal was always to maintain it as a one to two so you know direct fees should be you know no more than double the the investigative fees at the end of the new that that change it skyrocketed to eight to one so direct <laughs> fees were eight times higher than investigative fees. so you can see so this is a change that was implemented which you don't want to follow you don't want to go down that road so you know learn from other people's mistakes as you you build your proposed solutions so that would be yeah. my top four i know you asked for three but I, you know me, I can't. <laughs> no, when I, I can think uh, along the way of, of what you just said, having a change champion, you touched on that. It, it's very, very important. It goes back to having a measurable objectives. So there's, there's always a qualitative and quantitative aspect to every change you make. Um, and, and, and understanding from from day one, what is it that you want to achieve at the end of that journey? Uh, it's going to dictate the path to get there. Um, and um, I see a lot of, of resistance and, and um, um, I think the resistance um, doesn't always have to do with the fact that pharma companies or pharma industry is, is uh, traditionally highly conservative. I keep, I keep hearing this, you know, pharma is conservative, slow, it's very, uh, change is very slow. Um, but in fact, it's, it's not the industry. I think the industry has shown, particularly during COVID, that change is possible. And if you look at the mandates of the leadership of the top pharma companies around the world, they are all saying that embracing change and becoming more tech savvy and getting a handle of the data, it's, it's part of the core mission of the organization. Um, I think we still get bogged down in resistance on how to actually get started. Um, and that's, that's when 
particularly when it comes to technology, you cannot look at technology as uh, as software. You have to look at it as a complete solution. And that is the technology with the clear goals that need to be achieved, um, a package as a solution that includes strategy. Um, so I'm curious, where do you see resistance on your end when you are driving change? And let's say that the management is on board and it's saying, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna change. We're going to make things faster, more efficient. We're gonna work with less Excel. We are going to um, uh, have uh, analytics, for example, on how we outsource uh, maybe ahead of the journey, so we don't get from two to one to eight to one, <laughs> like in your example. Um, where do you, where do you see that resistance, and and how can, for example, organizations such as 4C um, support overcoming uh, that resistance? I mean, there's a lot to unpack on it. I mean, I agree with you around the the the, the reticence in our our industry. In a way, you know, is it being over overblown? Yes, we we proved that we can make changes. It was there. You know, we we often, however, blame external forces like regulators um, on doing this, and people are risk averse. Um, and of course, you've got other people who just want to fall back into old ways of working um and the so but going to your particular point um so one of the things that i've seen when with with technology is when there's too much choice um it's very easy to get into positions of what we call analysis paralysis you know we just keep on saying say you know which is the best one to do i don't want to make the wrong decision so it's easy to make no decision at all um and to fall back to the old ways of working and slipping back into into that um i think in in terms of of, of what we've got on the market at the moment to support you know from a technology perspective as, as karen pointed out and I, I agree um there isn't there isn't much you know there's there's a lot of procurement systems but it's not they're not suited to the nuances of a, of a complicated clinical trial arrangement um but where i see resistance is again people have got very fixated on on how they currently do things um you know and again when you're going to have to make an investment understanding how that is going to actually deliver on that investment is you know the return on investment and we saw that that's a, a difficult thing for people to assess particularly when it's you know we know how to break things down from a from a CRO perspective we know it you know in terms of you know hours times rate times tasks times people equals total cost when the company has made a, a an investment ahead of time and is, is is saying this is how much it's going to cost you that can look like a very significant outgoing that's required and it's difficult to then assess what that 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 return is going to be and how quickly you're going to see the benefits associated with it and but it, it is there and i think that's really got to be looked at primarily because we can't afford to keep on doing it the way that we've been doing it um it's a very manual very error ridden um process that we see when we come to to, to, to clinical outsourcing or cro's you know use of, of excel um, and we have a skills crisis going on. You know, we have uh, across the board, not just in in outsourcing, but in clean ops and in um, you know across the whole company um, spectrum. I hear and was talked about PCMG last year, and it's come up in lots of different areas. We can't afford. We haven't got the, the resources to carry on doing it the way that we need to to be doing it. So you know, it's to to demonstrate at a a, a personal level the benefits of of making that change as well as at an, at an organizational and operational level you know people buy the why you know is what i was told in the past why do i why do i do this why do i want to do this why should i do this <laughs> you know and okay yes you know we all buy into the overall goals the stated goals of our, our companies and our organizations but when it comes down to my my day-to-day -day work is this going to make it easier for me or is this going to make it harder um so addressing those concerns anticipating some of those concerns um, articulating it from how it's worked in in other cases you know people are great at, at, at buying into things when when somebody else has already done it um, as well so demonstrating how it is as as uh, has been beneficial um, to another organization is going to be absolutely key and that's again goes back to you know tapping into not making the same mistakes um, and and Obviously, having worked with lots of different companies and and helped them through through change, we have opportunities to to articulate that. Obviously, without breaking confidentiality, but you know, certainly showing how things can work. 
So yeah, that's how you know, I've seen it. I mean, in your perspective, in terms of resistance, you talk about the the benefits of having a champion. I was wondering if you can just sort of expand on that a little bit, you know, and how to how to find maybe and um, how to 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 utilize that champion within an organization. Yeah, um, I think um, you you also touched on on something that it's um, um, almost always uh, top of top of mind for me, um, which is influencing behaviors. Um, we, we, we speak a lot at strategic on about the cost of doing nothing, not necessarily internally, but we, we, we speak to our customers, um, about, um, the delay, for example, in making a decision. And, and there is a high cost of doing nothing in many, many aspects. One is that maintaining that lethargic status quo. Um, that actually doesn't lead to any outcome because it's 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 really a state of of maintenance um, that does not improve infrastructure, does not increase speed, does not realize savings. It's just doing more of the same. Um, then uh, we find that there is certain resistance in terms of uh, job defensibility. You know, what this technology going to make me less important? What we've seen over and over again is, in fact, this is not the case. Uh, in the light of the skill set, we know outsourcing people are a special breed. Uh, they need to understand operations. They need to be good negotiators. Uh, many of them have journeyed both on the CRO side and on the sponsor side. They, um, they are hard to find and, and, and difficult to retain. Um, and um, there is... a a mind shift in terms of spending less time in doing mechanical activities, such as, for example, taking unstructured beads and trying to put them side by side and guess uh, the interpretation of the CRO of your protocol, for example. You know, you know, countless hours are being spent on this exercise, or even when <clears throat> everything has been pre-mapped and the sponsor has a bid grid. It, it comes back still with some degree of interpretation that it's that's required. Um, but shifting the mindset from spending the time in in the guesswork, uh, in and spending more time into the analytics, for example, going back at the sourcing experience with that particular CRO over the last couple of years, uh, being able to easily pull out. Um, comparable bids um, and 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 drive insights in a way that doesn't consume hundreds of hours in a way that enables decision making. And what we are finding is that once <clears throat> the change is embraced, it's almost no turning back um, because it's actually it takes maybe a leap of faith. We've also found that proof of concept exercises are useful, um, especially when they are well defined and measured. And we found that uh, working with organizations that have experience in, in adoption, it, it shortens the, um, uh, the um, measurement of the ROI, shall, shall we put it this way. Um, but I think <clears throat> really largely the resistance is, is in perception. Uh, <clears throat> because again, once you make the leap of faith, um, you you go back and you say, hey, how come I didn't do that last year? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how come I spend another year doing the exact same thing? Um, and um, this, you know, this is changing. So I'm not going to stay here and complain and say, hey, change doesn't happen. It does happen and it, it is successful, um, but it could happen faster um, and the entire industry would benefit from it. I mean, I have a, a a theory about change that, I mean, well, it's not my theory, what I've applied, an, an existing theory around the theory of punctuated equilibrium, which is a uh, an evolutionary theory, um, which talks that basically species will stay in a very steady state, unchanged, um, or very little change going on from an evolutionary perspective when when there is no, no need to. But when an external force comes along and it forces, um, uh, that, that, that pushes, um, that that ecosystem evolutionary change happens very rapidly obviously in in you know in genetic terms um and and uh and rap rapidly and dramatically and i think we've seen something like that obviously through the pandemic 
you know, and people had to embrace it. Up until that point, we'd, we'd had reasons, plenty of reasons to say, I don't want to do it. Um, and I don't want to, um, to, to, to move forward. I, you know, I don't want to be the first to jump or the regulators might not like it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, interestingly, we proved through in the pandemic that we could change, change very rapidly as you saw. Um, and I, but I think we've gone, we're having another change point now. You know, we have a, a very challenging macroeconomic climate that's going on. Um, but I think we should see this as a positive. Let's embrace you know, this. There is, we have an opportunity here to make a number of different changes. So if you are minded to do that, if you've got that in your mindset, you know, let's use that momentum to see through this period where we have you know, significant push, you know, there are companies I'm being told are not yeah, you know, they're funding. You know, small biotech companies are having real issues associated with uh, the freeing up of, of venture capital and funding or private equity. You know, they are designing trials in a way that um, that perhaps is suboptimal now because they have to match what they can do to the amount of money that they've got. I think some of these areas, though, are missing an opportunity to look at the, how they spend their money. You know, and whether or not they can get more from this than um, than they. Um, than, than, than they thought, you know? So yes, redesign your trials, uh, but look at how you're spending, how you can get um, you know, more um, more for your money in some regards, or use this opportunity to, to push through other change. It would be just a, a, a one observation that I'd make. And, and, and I think, Rob, you brought a very important uh, topic, which is um, we are uh, in a recession. Uh, or let's call it challenging macroeconomic uh, times. And um, it's not only the biotechs that are impacted, it's, it's the mid to large pharma as well in, in, uh, in different ways. Uh, looking at the biotechs, which have been the bread and butter of, of, of our business. Um, <clears throat> you still need to invest in order to save. There is just no way around it because if you shortcut your the time you spend in for example designing your rfp if you shortcut the time you spend on analyzing the bids coming back or or to your point thinking about your resourcing before you think about your sourcing uh, strategy um, or if you simply go for the lowest cost for example the lowest cro bid um, that that's not necessarily the winning strategy because um, you know, the cost may catch up over time, the lack of benchmark data may um, have you um, over uh, pay um, for, the, for the particular study. Um, and um, shortening, for example, the, the time to receive a, a response back from the CRO, it always blows my mind when, when companies <laughs> spend uh, you know, years on writing a protocol and they give the CRO two weeks, two to, weeks. Produce, <laughs> to produce two weeks. a whole strategy uh, well, it could be around 30 it. Million, you know, this amount like of money. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, the, the biotechs, um, um, even more so now, when they need to understand the spend to reach a particular milestone, because that milestone uh, may mean more funding. Um, mm -hmm that is it's it's has not changed and in my mind now in tougher times bringing the strategy spending more time in due diligence it, it should be top priority because it can have serious impact for the success of the particular study if you look no, at the mid-sized company um they are growing very fast but they may have a freeze on hiring people um and that makes it extremely difficult because uh, there is a stage of maturity change when when the biotechs all of a sudden are growing, they have you know more studies starting, moving out of phase ones into phase two and phase threes, which are a whole different business, and they don't necessarily get additional headcount. Uh, that again makes it very difficult to stay on top of that change and then uh, support that growth in a sustainable manner. And look at what's happening in big pharma. How many people have been laid off? Now, but the work is by no means less. Um, so you have to be creative, quote unquote, uh, and, and invest upfront in order to save on the tail end because with less people, but the same amount of work, you have to bring in efficiency. 
and it's not in people alone. No, so, no, no, absolutely. And I mean, you, yeah, there's. there's I'm a, sorry, Rob. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt here for a moment. I apologize, but uh, we're we're actually over over time here, and we do have a couple of questions that I'd like to get to you guys oh. before we before we lose all all of our attendees. So okay. I'm gonna, I'll toss it to the two of you to decide who's going to answer. The first question is. How long would you estimate it would take to implement change such as this? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, you I mean, yes. Because you would thank have you. My other question. Yeah, thank you for that. Great, well, I'm, I'm going right? to tell a tell a story then to answer that one. I think because <laughs> um, it's again, I mean, how long is a piece of string? I guess is is a difficult one, but yeah, you know, it depends on on the nature of the change. Um, but I'm going to talk with give it just. Uh, yeah, I'm going to answer with with a, with a story. Um, so years ago, when I was working at um, uh, earlier in my career, I was in, when I was in analytical research and, and development, and I was looking to implement a, an FSP arrangement to support the analytical chemistry. And I was asked by one of the senior management to say, "How long would um, would it take to 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 to, to implement this change?" And uh, and I said, "Realistically, six months." At which point, the the, the senior manager replied and go, "Okay, great, you you've." You've got to do it in three. Um, and it's like, well, and, and I, I could see that this was just the manager wanting to be, look, I can, you know, you, you've obviously put buffer in this. You're making it easy for yourself. I'm going to be the, the big taskmaster who's going to drive it to, to make it, um, to do it in, in, in three. So this is around talks about that stakeholder management, managing expectations, managing the the, 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 the need. And I, I think my response at the time was, okay, well, I can do something in three, but then I'm going to walk away and I'm going to leave and it's going to take you two years to get it working right. <laughs> yeah, so it goes back to again that upfront investment, that you know the one ten one hundred rule, the cost of of getting it right compared to the cost of fixing something compared to the cost of failure, um, and so being able to explain that, and but of course you have got to explain it that this isn't just a got a lot of buffer in that time to to achieve this. Um, what you're looking for is to try and fix it all into the the right time window and explain. This is why it's going to take so long. This is why it's going where it's going to deliver the value. Um, you know, and that I suppose would be my answer. You know, it depends, <laughs> of course. But maybe that helps I, in a way. I, I would add very quickly that uh, change has to be measured a bit in baby steps. Um, if you are overly ambitious at the get-go, I don't know what your manager wanted to implement, you know, or to change. Uh, but maybe there is some positive return you can show after a month and then another positive return at the three months mark and then maybe a whole other um, success story at the end of six months or at the end of, of the one year. Um, I think it's very important because if you um, start on the journey hoping that uh, all of a sudden everything is going to change and it's going to be so fundamentally different than the starting point, um, then you are only calling for for disappointment. Um, mm -hmm. Change, I think, has to be embraced in pieces. And again, to the point that I brought earlier, and you brought it in having a change management plan, it has to be measurable. Um, and it and, and adoption does require baby steps. Uh, you know, let's show that you can you know source faster using uh, technology. Let's start there. Then we think about how you can do a hundred RFPs. You know, let's just take one step at a time. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, Excellent. Okay. All right. So I have a I have a follow on question to that one. Okay. For you, uh, which I'll actually yeah, maybe we'll get another story out of Rob for this one. But uh, okay. So what what should I focus on first to achieve the most impact? People, processes, or technology? Uh, do you want to go first, or shall I? Um, I mean, that's, say, a, simple, that's a really say, simple answer. Ready? That's, well, exactly. I mean, that's that's obviously the most simple answer. Um, but I, I, I think, I mean, obviously, it's you. Know, you talk about baby steps. You talk about sorry, no story. I'm just going to you know try and <laughs> win this one. I guess um, it's where where the pinch points in your organisation. You know, uh, where what is causing this? Or yes, baby steps are one thing. You also want to reduce the time to to peak return. I guess it's a bit like time to peak sales in, in commercialisation. You want to get to the maximum or the, the the most impact as quickly as possible. So if you're if it is the processes that are getting the way, if you if technology is what's going to reduce errors, you know if it's people and training. I mean, obviously the, all three of them go hand in hand. 
Um, but this goes back again to understanding your problems first. You know, is it the case that you've got people who, you know, let's look at, at, at smaller companies. A lot of them don't necessarily invest in, in um, you know, they, they get clean ops or different groups doing the outsourcing process, you know, and so maybe actually looking at abilities to bring in the specialist skill sets, let's keep clean ops people doing clean ops tasks, you know, because that's what they, they need to do. And you can get, they, that is the best return on investment for, for the skill set that you've brought in there. Um, is it errors, you know, the speed to, to RFP, is it, you know, all the different things, is technology going to help on, on these things? So, you know, it's it, where it's, you know, what is going to have the biggest impact um, in terms of your measurable results, I think is the, the, the best way of looking at it. So again, it's, it's understanding what your problem is that you're trying to solve will then guide you to where you prioritize on process technology or, or, or people. I think that was the, the question, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. I, mean, I, I, I completely agree with this. I think uh, every time we start on the journey, we do a little gap analysis. And in some cases it has to be extensive, but with small biotechs, the gap analysis usually reveals mm, there are no people, there are no processes, and there is no technology. So you actually have an opportunity to uh, start on a fresh foundation. Um, and some companies um, fail uh, and some companies succeed. And for the ones that succeed, it's, it's starting to your point um, uh, on the right approach from day one. And that saves tremendous time down the road. But but then, of course, you know, there are other examples we've seen where companies have grown very, very rapidly, yeah. you know, and you've got processes that work when you're a small organization exactly. and you're running so fast to keep on, you know, with an expansion. It now doesn't work but because you've got so much going on that you haven't actually got the, the bandwidth to go back and look at, at actually changing the process. You haven't, you're too busy to become efficient, if you know what I mean. You know, so these are the kind of things where you look at the actual processes and it goes across the board from 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 large to small or, you know, things get you know, worked with very large companies where um, almost they've got lost in the woods in that now nobody, everybody thinks that somebody else is the, the person responsible for doing this particular job and, it, and so it's not getting done. You know, and I was looking at change orders, I was looking at cost management and everybody thought that somebody else was responsible for actually thinking and looking and benchmarking is this the right thing to do to an extent that, that nobody was and so they were just signing stuff off without you know and costs were, were spiraling so you can see how it all puts puts together and there's there's opportunities in all these these areas and it goes back to understanding your organization so i think we are way over time about 15 minutes so for those of you who uh, have more questions um uh, please send them to us uh most likely Rob and I will do another webinar probably towards the tail end of the year. Um, it was wonderful talking to you, Rob. And, and again, we could go on and on and on on this subject. Um, and hopefully the audience um, found uh, some useful insights into how to approach change uh, on your end. So thank you so much, Rob. Thank, thank you, you to the audience. Thank you for hosting. Appreciate um, it. And uh, we will publish um, publish the um, the webinar as well. I think uh, Karen knows best. Yes, what, yes. What we will we'll get the link out to you guys uh, shortly, within probably within 24 hours. So you can either listen to it again or send it to your colleagues. Fantastic. Thank okay. you, Karen. Thank, Thank you, Anka. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.